Right. If you have your Bibles with you, if you would open to page, or not to page, but to the book of Samuel, um, chapter 18. And uh, today our verses will begin with verse 17, and I'm going to read through the end of that chapter. The title of today's sermon is Blessed Are the Meek. It says, Then Saul said to David, Here is my elder daughter, Merib. I will give her to you for a wife. Only be valiant for me and fight the Lord's battles. For Saul thought, Let not my hand be against him, but let the hand of the Philistines be against him. And David said to Saul, Who am I and who are my relatives, my father's clan in Israel, that I should be son-in-law to the king? But at the time when Merib, Saul's daughter, should have been given to David, she was given to Adriel, the Mehalothite, for a wife. Now Saul's daughter, Michael, loved David, and they told Saul, and the thing pleased him. Saul thought, let me give her to him that, he may be a, that she may be a snare for him, and that the hand of the Philistines may be against him. Therefore, Saul said to David a second time, you shall now be my son-in-law. And Saul commanded his servants, speak to David in private and say, Behold, the king has delight in you, and all his servants love you. Now then become the king's son-in-law. And Saul's servants spoke to these, those words in the ears of David. And David said, Does it seem to you a little thing to become the king's son-in-law, since I am a poor man and have no reputation? And the servants of Saul told him, Thus, and so did speak, David speak. Then Saul said, Thus shall you say to David, The king desires no bride price except a hundred foreskins of the Philistines, that he may be avenged of the king's enemies. Now Saul thought to make David fall by the hand of the Philistines. And when his servants told David these words, it pleased David well to be the king's son-in-law. Before the time had expired, David arose and went along with his men, and killed 200 of the Philistines. And David brought their foreskins, which were given in full number to the king, that he might become the king's son-in-law. And Saul gave him his daughter, Michael, for his wife. But when Saul saw and knew that the Lord was with David, and that Michael, Saul's daughter, loved him, Saul was even more afraid of David. So Saul was David's enemy continually. Then the commanders of the Philistines came out to battle, and as often as they came out, David had more success than all the other servants of Saul, so that his name was highly esteemed. Amen. In this passage, we dive deeper into the complexities of David and Saul's relationship. More of that is revealed here. David was a friend of Saul, and that is very clear. David looked for the best interest of his friend. David was there to serve his friend. David loved his friend. But Saul, on the other hand, well, he did not see David as a friend, but rather as an enemy. So you could, it's fair to say, and we talked about this last week, that Saul was a pretty horrible friend to David because Saul saw David as an enemy. One man's actions were driven by love and respect. That would be David. And then the other man by jealousy and hatred. Of course, that would be Saul. We see the result of each man's actions based on where their disposition was, where their heart was. One man recognized and submitted to God's will. And the other man resented it. And he tried his very best to make his own way. But we know how that goes. The Bible says in his heart, man plans his ways, but it is the Lord that directs his steps. See, a major difference between the two men was the presence of humility. And you're going to hear that come up often in this sermon because that's pretty much the theme, humility. This passage teaches us that humility towards God makes a huge difference in how we respond to life's circumstances. And I would even go as far to say that it ultimately helps us to shape to shape us to who in the, in, into the people that we are. As we take a closer look at this passage, as I always 
pray before we start. May the Lord give us wisdom to understand. May he give us the conviction to stir our hearts and then also courage to respond as we should. First thing I want to do is I want to give you some context and to help you dive deeper into this uh, complex relationship between David and, and, and Saul. The beginning of chapter 18 covers David's relationship with the royal family. This is verses 1 through 16. There we see that Jonathan and David had a tremendous relationship. They made a covenant with each other. They were truly best friends. They were each, each other's keeper. And they loved their neighbors as themselves, or they loved each other as themselves. So it was a wonderful biblical friendship that we see there. But on the other hand, Saul and David had a tumultuous relationship. And this was not the fault of David. See, Jonathan made a covenant with David. And Jonathan humbly accepted God's choosing of David as a king. Talked about it last week, how it was, it was Jonathan who was in line for the kingdom, but God chose David. And we see this wonderful act of humility where Jonathan binds himself to David, not only as a friend, but as his king. But on the other hand, we see something completely different. Instead of love, we see Saul was jealous over David's accomplishment. And that jealousy grew to, into unbridled anger towards David, towards the person who was supposed to be his friend. And then we also see that Saul tried to kill David twice by throwing a spear at him. He also, that didn't work, so he, all, he removed David from the royal court. And then he demoted his military rank. And again, none of this was the fault of David. He was doing and he did everything he was asked to do. In fact, he went above and beyond and he continues to do that in our passage today. But Saul was doing all of this in the hopes that David would lose favor with the people and ultimately God. David was trying to, or Saul was trying to make David fall, so to speak. Now we fast forward to our verses here today, 17 through 30. You, you can see how Saul is still a wicked man. He is still after David. He wants him to fall. He wants him to fail. But Saul, as a wicked man, is also very cunning. And Saul begins to change his actions towards David. But his intentions remained the same. And so it looks like Saul is being kind to David, but he really isn't. See, he wanted to take advantage of God's favor over David's life. He wanted to use that. He recognized that. Why did he recognize that? Well, because Saul experienced that at one time in his life. When Saul was anointed king, the Bible talks about the spirit of God rushing upon him and helping him to fulfill that ministry. And then whenever he was reject, rejected as king, the Bible talks about the spirit of God leaving him and him no longer having that ability to do but he recognizes the presence of the Spirit in David. And he knows how powerful it is because it was once upon him. So he is using, in a sense, he is using David, in a sense, he is using God to get what he wants, to gain God's favor. But he also wants harm to come to David. So in order for Saul to do this, he seemed to be blessing David through his actions, but he had ill intentions for him. And I want to show you three examples of this. First of all, verse 17. Um, David was an exceptional warrior for Saul. And a, a lot of times in the Bible, you'll see people like David who get rewarded from their king. And a lot of times they'll give their oldest daughter to that person as a reward. Not only to reward them for their faithfulness, but to also ensure that there is peace between them, uh, between the two families, so that that person who is a valiant warrior or a valiant servant can serve them all the days of their life. So that's what we see here in verse 17. It says, Then Saul said to David, Here is my elder daughter, Merib. Now notice, look at the blessing, look at the blessing he seems to be given to David. I will give her to you for a wife. Right? When you look at this situation and you see who David is versus who Saul is now, 
David is this, you know, comes from a relatively poor family, a family who is not well renowned, who is, who is not well known within the nation of Israel compared to the king. And so you see David who seems to be blessed by Saul. But look, this is what Saul really wants from that relationship. Only be valiant for me and fight the Lord's battles. There he goes. He's blessing David, but at the same time, he wants to use that gift that God has given him, that blessing that God has given him, that favor that God has given him for his advantage. And then we get to peek into the mind of a sinner. We get to peek into um, the mind of a wicked man. For Saul thought, let not my hand be against him, but the hand, but let the hand of the Philistines be against him. That's example number one. Example number two, look at verses 20 and 21. Now, that didn't work out. For some reason, Saul didn't give um, Merib to David. Instead, he gave her to another man. And so now he has another daughter. And it says, now Saul's daughter, Michael, loved David. And they said to Saul, and the thing pleased him. Now, here's the pretend blessing. Saul thought, let me give her to him so that she may be, oh, that's not the blessing part. Excuse me. The blessing part comes later. Here's his intention. Saul thought, let me give her to him that she may be a snare for him and that the hand of the Philistines may be against him. Right? That's his intentions. Therefore, Saul said to David a second time, here's the fake blessing. Oh, David, I messed up the first time, but you know what? I have Michael. She's better than my first daughter anyway. I'm going to give her to you. Now you're going to be my son-in-law. So David responds to that in humility. And he says, there, you guys are taking this really lightly. Like, he doesn't even mention the first time that Saul did him wrong. He's just thinking about the gift that he is getting. He's basically saying, I, I, don't, deserve, I don't deserve to be called the son-in-law of the king. So here, verse 25, this is Saul's response. Then Saul said, thus shall you say to David, the king desires no bride price except a hundred foreskins of the Philistines. There is the pretend blessing that he may be avenged of the king's enemies. There is the false motive there. He, he wants to use David because he knows that David is being empowered by God. Then we get to peek in the mind of of a wicked man again and where it says now Saul thought to make David fall by the hand of the Philistines so we have three examples just there in our passage where really Saul does not intend to bless David at all Saul intends to bless himself and not only that Saul his intentions are to hurt David but yet David remains faithful now, what's interesting is that while Saul was treating David badly, David, he did not fight evil with evil. I can't imagine how hard that was. Because there are times in, in our lives, and, and I know, I, I can speak for myself, but I can also, I can speak for everybody in here, where you want to take vengeance on somebody. Somebody has wronged you, and you, you want to fight evil with evil. If that has never been you, then I, I need to speak with you because I need you to pray for me. David did not fight evil with evil. Instead, he humbly submitted to the will of God and to the authority of the king that God had placed over him. See, David carried out everything that Saul asked him to. Therefore, David was faithful to his king's orders. And the Lord took care of David as he humbly submitted to his will. For instance, I want to show you how the Lord gave him favor, regardless of how Saul treated him. Uh, the wife that he finally got from Saul, Michael, Saul gave her to him with ill intention. But the passage, or the scripture says in verse 28, that she loved him. Turned out to be a great wife for David, something he needed. 
Also, the more Saul plotted against David, Scripture says in verse 29, the more he feared him. Why did he fear him? Because he recognized God's presence and protection over his life. And then verse 30, the, the Lord, we see that it's clear that the Lord brought calamity to David's life. If we're going to say that, that the Lord is sovereign over Saul and, and, and what he's doing to Saul, we must also recognize that the Lord is sovereign over David's life and also the calamity that is being brought into his life. He's using Saul as a vessel to work on David. So the, the, the Lord brought calamity to David's life to use it to make him stronger. To use it to increase his favor amongst the people. Look at uh, verse 30. Let me reread that. It says, Then the commanders of the Philistines came out to battle, and as often as they came out, David had more success than all the servants of Saul, so that his name was highly esteemed. That's the context of the story here. That's what's going on. We get a better feeling of, of this complex relationship between Saul and David and everything that's being done and also the purpose for which it is being done. Now let's look at some biblical truths within this passage. And I said that humility is going to be the theme today. As we look at this passage, there's one thing that just really pops out at us, and it's the fact that humility is a trait of godliness. And, and, and that, that's where I'm going to leave it for right now, then I'll explain it. But humility is a trait of godliness. You say, Pastor, that's, that's pretty obvious. It, it, it is obvious, but that's something that we have to hear on a regular basis. That's something that we have to remind ourselves about. Because we get confused or we forget those traits of godliness that we need to display. And the times that we forget is the times that we act in the flesh. The times that we do not take the time to pray. The times that we do not take, take, take the time to think under the sovereignty and authority of the Lord. When we just react, we forget that humility is a trait of godliness. And that is something that we need to be reminded of. See, David's heart was being molded by the Lord through the, his circumstances. And we have to recognize that. This gave him the opportunity to be humbled and to be sanctified by God. We're always praying for the Lord to take this away, take this away, take this unfavorable circumstance away, take this pain away, take this hurt away, take this person away. And we, we, we pray and we're so focused on the Lord to take these things away from us, but we do not recognize what the Lord is doing in us through those things. When we commit ourselves to the Lord, when we believe upon the Lord that he is Lord and Savior of our lives, that he is sovereign over every detail of our lives, then we come to understand that those things that the Lord brings to us are for our sanctification. They are there to humble us so that we recognize that there is somebody else in charge, that there is somebody else who is greater than us, that we are not God, but rather we serve God. On the other hand, Saul's heart grew cold and rigid through his circumstances, and that prevented him from acting humbly, and that prevented him from accepting God's judgment over his actions. As I said before, Saul was trying to make his own way. What God was doing in his life, it displeased Saul. He wasn't happy with it. He was trying to reject Saul's will, or excuse me, God's will. But we all know what happens whenever we try to do that. See, in Christ, humility is not wasted. It's not and you know, humility is one of those things that it feels like it's like, like you're wasting time. Humility is one of those things where you feel like, I'm just letting this person take advantage of me. Humility feels like I'm just letting this person walk all over me. It, it just shame, it feels shameful sometimes when you step out in humility. It feels shameful. Why? Because the flesh the flesh wants to be exalted. The 
flesh wants vengeance. The flesh wants control. And when it comes to humility, you're giving that all to God. You're saying, I, this is not my battle to fight nor to win. My battle is to be faithful to God. And God will take care of my life. So in Christ, humility is not wasted. It brings about God's desired effect in one's life and in one's attitude towards God. Humility acts as a fertilizer for the fruit of the Spirit. And I understand it is a fruit of the Spirit, but when we are humble, it seems to activate growth. It, it acts as a fertilizer to the fruit of the Spirit to blossom in our hearts. But more importantly, it's shown through our actions. Christ said this, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. To be meek is to, be, is to place yourself under the authority of someone else. It doesn't mean you're weak. It just means that you're powerful, but under control. The creature answers to the creator. That's something that we all must know and understand and acknowledge. The creator directs the steps of the creature. In other words, God is God and we are not. Now, now that I said that, to believe that is one thing. Because I think I, I see heads nodding. They're like, yeah, go ahead, pastor, preach it. Amen. Everybody's nodding, everybody's agreeing for the most part. But I think you'll agree with me when I say this. To believe that truth is one thing, but to live humbly according to that truth is another. If, if it weren't, we wouldn't be here. Uh, if, if, if it wasn't difficult, we wouldn't need Christ. And we need him. We need him every single day, every single moment of our lives. See, there is much in the New Testament about Divisions within the church, factions, selfishness, greed, hatred, laziness, covetousness, bitterness. And I'm not even speaking about the world. As I told you, that's within the church. These are things that happen that either Paul, Peter, John, one of the apostles are, are, are covering and teaching us in Scripture to stay away from these things. Why are, why are they having to, to teach us? Why are they having to direct us to stay away from these things? Because we all struggle with them. We all struggle with them. Humility is not something that we are born with. Look at a child. A little child is the most prideful thing you could ever see. They're precious, but they're prideful. They're so selfish. They want everything. And see, as adults, we learn to hide that. At least a child is really transparent in his actions. He, he or she is going to go and do what they want. They don't get it. They start crying. Us, we, we've learned to hide that a little bit. But yet our heart still wants that thing. We still throw fits, but it looks a little bit different. Humility is not natural. We all struggle with it. That's why the Bible tells us to walk in it and to stay away from those things. That fuels prideful thinking and action. See, when we talk about selfishness and greed and hatred and laziness and, and, and covetousness and bitterness, these things stem from a prideful heart does, that does not settle for meekness. Here, the American way is not to be meek, but to be strong, to take control. Don't let anybody walk all over you. Don't let anyone make you look like a fool. See, in our hearts, in reality, what's going on, the bigger picture, the bigger problem, is that in our hearts, we want to be like God. If you go back to the garden, it's the same sin that Adam and Eve did. 
reason why they ate was because they wanted to be like us. The reason why we struggle with humility is because we want to be like God. What do I mean by that? Well, we want control. We want to control our own destiny. But see, that's where humility comes in. And that's where humility helps us to understand the ugliness of our sin and the need we have for Christ in all things. I am really surprised in those times where I am able to act humble. Um, and I say act, but be humble. It, it, it really surprises me. Um, a lot of times, and, and you know, it, I need to do it a whole lot more. Uh, and, I, and like everybody else, there are times where I can, I, can, I can display humbleness, but I'm struggling with something else in my heart. Right? And, and that's, that's where I'm asking, Lord, please help me with that. Please help me with that because I have sinned against you even though it, it, has, it was only in my mind and in my heart. But when humility steps in, we start to see beautiful things that are displayed. We start to see true worship of God in the way we respond to people and the way we interact with people. Um, whenever humility comes in, in the face of painful persecution, how many of you have just been through just what you feel is just this you feel persecuted by the enemy, by the world, by, by your spouse or by your family, whatever it is, you feel this painful persecution. And when, when we are in the right mindset and when we have humility helping us, instead of reacting in a negative way, instead of fighting evil with evil, humility helps us to say, Lord, not my will be done. Or, after the sting of a personal attack by a loved one, and that sting hurts so much, it, 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 it goes down into the heart, and it seems like just venom just fills your heart, and your heart is broken. And, and you, it's, it's hard to deal with this personal attack by a loved one. Well, when you have humility, humility helps you to say, what you meant for evil against me, God meant it for good. Or a personal failure. We all deal with those all the time where we fail, we sin against God. Humility helps us to say, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. But when we have pride and we struggle with pride and we struggle with selfishness, we start to blame our sin on other people. See, the picture I'm painting is the picture we see before us in Scripture. Saul sinning against the Lord, blaming other people. Not my fault. And it's all his fault. David, on the other hand, is responding with humility. And we begin and see his growth. Now, I, I don't want to praise David too high because as we continue to study we're going to see the fall, right? Pride comes before the fall. That's why we can't just point to David here. Say, oh, this is the way you should be. If I were just to point to David and say, oh, this is, be humble people, well, that would not be fixing the problem. That's behavior modification. We, we do not modify our behavior just so that we can look like good people. Rather, we acknowledge the sin in us and we ask God to change our hearts and our actions. See, humility wasn't the way of David continually. Yeah, he gets to be used as a great example here. But there's only one who was truly humble. See, humility was the way of Christ. And if humility was the way of Christ, then it should be the way of the Christian. Listen to this out of Philippians chapter 2, starting in verse 3. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. 
Have this in mind among yourself, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and, on, and under the earth, and in every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. If I'm going to point you to anybody when it comes to humility or any other godly trait, I'm going, I'm going to point you to Jesus Christ our Lord. See, when life circumstances get difficult or overbearing, how we view ourselves makes a big difference. Using these two men as examples, David and Saul, if we view ourselves as priority number one, then we are going to claim that things aren't fair and that we are only the victim. Like Saul, we are going to try and make our own way no matter what. But if we view ourselves as vessels for honorable use, recognizing that there is a sovereign God over us and our lives are not our own, but he uses our lives as he sees fit, then we are going to see that what has happened to us is under the sovereign control of the Lord, and he will use it to glorify himself and to sanctify us. Like David, we will wait upon the Lord to help us in our time of need, and we will also trust him to provide for and fight for us. And that sounds great. Let's just call it a day and let's walk out of here and let's go and do that, okay? Yeah, how difficult is that? Here's the application. Humility helps us to be content in all things, okay? Because when we look at this situation here that's happening in 1 Samuel chapter 18 with David and Saul, just looking at this passage alone, it's, it's really encouraging because Saul, Saul is treating David badly. David is acting in humility, and God is just blessing David, just blessing him. But, but at the same time, David is dealing with a lot, a lot of calamity, a lot of difficulty, a lot of pain, but through it all, he's being blessed. I, I wonder, does David recognize the blessing? Does he feel like he's being blessed, or is he so focused on the bad things that are happening? Because if, if I, I try to put myself in that passage and try to put myself in both characters, and, and obviously I, I can relate more with Saul because I'm a, a sinful person and, and, and I have a problem with pride. Um, but when you relate yourself to David, you sit there and you wonder, man, I wonder if he recognizes God's blessings in his, in his life. Because I, I, I have a hard time recognizing it, even when I'm trying to walk in humility. I, I want things to change. I want things to be different. I want things to be according to my will. That's what I struggle with. And you know, when I'm struggling with that, it comes out in my prayer. Because I get down on my knees, I pray, and the very first thing out of my mouth is about me and what I'm dealing with. That, that's how I can tell I'm having a hard time with humility. And there, you know, there may be godly things that I want God to help me with, God to change, but my prayer is mostly about me. And then I eventually get to you, God. Eventually. We struggle with humility. And it shows. Because we are not content with where the Lord has us today. We're like, Lord, take this from me. And we forget the second part of that verse. Just take it. I don't want to deal with it. You deal with it, Lord. You take it. Put it somewhere. I don't care where you put it. Just, just don't put it in my life. See, it's important for us to know that we cannot have or display humility without the Lord. We must recognize it is a gift of the Holy Spirit and we cannot simply conjure it up ourselves. And that's why I say, if you try to leave here and you're like, okay, I'm going to be a humble person, you're going to fail the very first test that God brings to you. If left to our own devices, we would be like 
Saul here. Pride would give birth to jealousy, and jealousy would turn into hatred. And as it is, we already struggle with jealousy, hatred, and bitterness within our relationship, within our friendship. Many of us have a serious problem with pride, but we don't recognize it. We don't recognize it until we go through life's difficulties. I'm amazed at that, that, that problems with pride don't come whenever you have a lot of things. I, I think they do because you tend to think like, okay, well, look at what I've done. Look at what I've built up. So that's that side of it. But on the flip side, there are some very poor, pitiful people that deal with the sin of pride. Why? Because they're saying, why me? They're saying, this is not fair. They're saying, I don't deserve this. Signs of sinful pride is to think that God is not treating you fairly or that your problems are greater than the problems of everybody else. That's when we get into the realm of self-pity. Self-pity is brought forth through the labor of pride. Self-pity keeps us so consumed with our own problems that we do not act in faith to help others. We, we recognize the command for the church to help us, but we neglect the command for us to help the church. See, ministering to others... It is difficult, it is hard, but it is also necessary because we have been commanded by God to do it. We should not, we should not let our own circumstances run our attitudes and actions. And I have a hard time with that. And it usually show, shows on Sunday mornings of all days. You know when it shows? Whenever I have to get the kids ready to come to church. That's when it shows. Man. That's difficult sometimes. And, and you know, I, I'm trying to be prepared for the sermon, and no matter what the topic is, it could be on like a topic like humility. If it's not going well in the morning, man, I blow my top. And God uses that to keep me before I come to the pulpit. It's hard to not let our circumstances run our attitudes and actions. I'm not saying be fake. I'm not even saying, hey, stop struggling, because how can we do that? But recognize your sin. Plead to the Lord for help. And think upon the things that the Lord has given you, that the Lord has done for you. And seek pleasure and fulfillment in what he has already done. When we let our circumstances guide our attitudes and actions, in a sense, that's idolatry. You say, well, how do you make that connection? Well, nothing or nobody should run our attitude or action except for the sovereign Lord that we serve. Right? We bow to knee only to him. If we're not walking by his commands in scripture, then we're not serving him as Lord. We're sinning against him. If we desire humility, we must completely rely on the Lord for it, and we must also be willing to go through pain, suffering, and heartache. We must be ready for that. Because be careful. You go home and you say, Lord, teach me to be the most humble person that's ever lived. Man. If I heard you pray that prayer and I was standing next to you, I would probably take about five steps back away from you. Because you're about to learn a very valuable lesson. We pray to be humble. We pray to act in humility. But we do not count the cost. Humility is forged in the fire of pain, suffering, and heartache. But it's in that fire that, grow, that God grows our hearts grows our faith. He grows humility in us through those things. The Bible says that god godliness and contentment are a great pairing. In fact, 1 Timothy chapter 6 verse 6 says that 
but godliness with contentment is great gain. For we bought, we brought nothing into the world, and we cannot take anything out of the world. Paul, Paul knew the maturation of humility well. In fact, he wrote to the church in Philippi about it. Philippians chapter 4, the, he writes, Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And humility is such a difficult thing. But it's so necessary. If we are going to be united as believers, if we're going to serve one another, if we are going to honor God and love our neighbors as ourselves, we have to be humble. And we have to rely on God for that. Don't be happy with where you're at today when it comes to humility. Don't look at yourself and say, man, I'm, I'm a pretty humble person. Sounds silly, but we, we do that a lot. We compare ourselves to other people. Like that brother, that sister, they need to learn humility. Have you ever been in a room or a building that has a lot of doors? I, when I started working at Formosa many years ago, um, the, the building we were working in was uh, a pretty simple building, rectangular, and uh, not, not too, you know, not, not, not too crazy or anything like that. And through the years, as the company grew, um, our department would grow, or it did grow, and as the department grew, they started just to put offices in different places, doors, offices. And what started out as a simple building became like a, like this maze. And I was thinking about that as I was thinking about topic of humility. Whenever you're working or you, maybe you live in a building that has a lot of doors, you know, uh, people would come in and they would want to visit somebody, you know, go and visit somebody, talk with them about something work related. And it was always, it was funny because at, at one time I didn't have an office, but I sat there in what we called the bullpen area and you would see people come in and as construction changed the building, the more confusion it and it got, it got kind of weird because some doors looked like uh, closets and they were actually offices. Oh, seriously, yeah, there was this office like right by um, where the break room was and it was at one time a large closet. We used to keep, keep regulatory uh, requirements there, regulatory records there, and it was a pretty big closet. Well, they gutted that out and then they replaced it with an office. So. For the longest time, that door was in the middle of the hallway, and it seemed like a closet. People would think it was a closet or something else, and no, you open it, it's a big old office. So these doors were kind of misleading, and obviously that's where labeling and everything else comes in, and we need that sometimes with some of these buildings. But um, if you picture that confusion, you might have it in mind to visit someone specific. You're going to go and visit someone, but to get there, you must go through the right door. Right? Otherwise, you end up in a closet, or you end up outside, or you end up in a different place. Um, going to make hospital visits. Man, that is extremely confusing sometimes. I, I've, I've gotten used to the hospital layout, but when they make changes, you go into one door and you end up in a different hospital. You start off at DTAR, you go into the wrong door, you end up you know, at a, at a different hospital with the same building. So whenever we are doing that, it's important whenever we go through these doors and we're looking for these people, you must go through the right door. Otherwise, you may go basically somewhere you shouldn't. I want to relate that to our relationship with God. If we are going to commune with God, then it must start through the door of humility. Humility is the way to God. It truly is. It's not the only way. And I'm not... I'm, I'm not replacing Christ here. I'm speaking in Christ. But if we are going to see God for who he is and see ourselves for who we are, 
It's going to take humility. Right? So it's important for us to approach life through the door of humility. Humility enables us to be understanding of our place and circumstance in life and to find purpose in it. That is so important. So many people struggle with purpose because they struggle with pride. We want our purpose to align with our will, but it doesn't work that way. Our purpose aligns with God's will. Humility enables us to be understanding of our place and to find purpose in it. Going through the door of pride and self-pity and resentfulness only makes us sink further into the sin of self-centeredness and idolatry. You see, humility helps us to see our circumstances for what they are. And in the face of our circumstances, we confess to the Lord, your grace is sufficient for me. Let's pray. Father, we